Uh, uh, you see that uh, some part of this meeting is going to appear. I don't know what it is. Is it here? Some kind of one. Uh, what? Yeah, any. Some part of the part of the discussions. Now, uh, let me uh, uh, well, uh, our guest. Uh, coming from as far as United States, Germany, and, uh, and uh, Paul. <laughs> Paul is not so far, but I guess. Uh, we have a Pojo from Tokyo, as a laboratory, which is, I think, the furthest. Johnson <laughs> Park from Santa Cruz, which is slightly less further away. And uh, I think uh, Chihiro from Germany is just about the same distance. At least it takes about the same time. For him, you know, how you probably you know how to how work. Um, okay, so now let me, let me just, before I start my uh, so called introduction, uh, let me just uh, briefly tell you all. I already uh, sketched to my uh, guests from far away what this WCU is all about, so I'm not going to go into that uh, part which is mostly negative, uh, and I, I suppose it's not a good idea to, to talk about negative here. So I will try to talk about more, more on the positive side, and uh, uh, let me just briefly tell you what the objective of this particular uh, gathering is all about. Now, uh, uh, there are three projects in WCU, and this is what is called the third project. And uh, uh, there is a certain, certain uh, let's say, uh, desirata, you know, you know, something which is desired by, by the funding agency, which is the government, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is pretty well structured, and uh, it has a lot of regulations, and lots of rules, and so on and so on. And uh, uh, the, the kind of rules that are set up in that particular project are not exactly along the line that we would like to have. Now, the, uh, the third project we are involved in, in principle, should have more flexibility uh, in such a way that, the, uh, that uh, we could have some kind of inflow of ideas and, uh, and discussions which are not usually done in the universities. However, this is what is called a world-class university. Therefore, it should look like some kind of university activity. Now, there's a, there's a requirement that uh, there be uh, some kind of lecture by a so-called distinguished professor from a foreign country. And uh, he's supposed to give a series of lectures. Now, for five years, giving a series of lectures on what he has been doing uh, is, a, is a pretty boring business, I think. Uh, all, this, all the people who will be the first time would find the second time not much interesting and maybe the third time is totally boring and they would not like to have that anymore. After all, they're in the university, there are lots of lectures and you're learning techniques and, uh, and uh, uh, all kinds of new developments in the new technology which are involved. So, uh, so it's boring to have a, a distinguished lecturer giving a, a series of lectures on what he has written in a book. Now, my idea of having this WCU is to have a lot more flexibility and, and, and try to get some new ideas from elsewhere. Uh, yeah, not probably younger people who are working on something new and uh, they may be in conflict with, with others and so on, but it's, uh, it, they would be much more interesting than talking about something which has been established. So, the idea of this particular thing is to invite uh, only a few, not so many, we, we don't have much money. Uh, so yeah, with this particular project does not have much money, so forget about that. Uh, just a few who are t working on something which is we are not familiar with. In other words, we would like to learn something from them rather than we teach them. And maybe by learning from them, we could teach the younger people who are supposed to be. Who, so that, that's the objective. Uh, this, uh, I always emphasize on what is called uh, flexibility. And the flexibility 
is not something which is uh, accepted so easily by government funded uh, agencies. Uh, they don't know about what flexibility is. So we have to somehow conform with, the, with this particular pattern and we would like to sort of compromise in some sense uh, by having kind of what is called a lecture, a special lecture. Right? It's more of a discussion uh, by the, the young, upcoming people whom we have invited. So you are part of that particular group. Now, um, there's interesting, the, the, the kind of problem that we are dealing with is, uh, is a kind of something which nobody else is doing. In other words, uh, we would like to do something which, uh, which is not second time around. We would like to do something, something new. However, all the easy things have been done and they are published in, uh, published in, in some very well-known journals like Nature and Science and get a lot of credit for it and uh, get A grades and so on. Uh, What's left over is all quite difficult and sometimes it's quite messy, uh, complicated business. And now in, con in connection with this particular nature of research, I would like to just simply mention something about the heavy ion physics because heavy ion physics uh, recently has been uh, on the limelight and it has been attracting a lot of attention. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a program, it's a project, heavy ion project was developed many, many years ago by people working in sort of all the areas of physics, nuclear, nuclear physics. And they have pushed this idea, and when this idea was being pushed at the very beginning, there were lots of objections. Uh, uh, some of the objections are uh, probably known to other people, but uh, let me just uh, cite a couple of jokes or objections by very well-known people. For instance, uh, Liam Lederman is a Nobel Prize winner, a part of the experimentalist. And uh, when he heard about the heavy ion project, he said, oh, heavy ion is like a colliding pairs of a garbage and waiting to see a pearl drop out. Uh, I guess everybody knows what pearl is, or is it's a jewel. And uh, Feynman also made the remark. And said, uh, well, if you want to know how the watch works, you don't want to smash it into two pieces. This is this is his remark. And there have been many other remarks. But then suddenly we found that uh, uh, this uh, sheer, sheer viscosity divided by entropy, which seems to indicate that there's perfect liquid way up there in the in the quark gluon plasma, that's a total surprise to many people. And uh, uh, something like that happens once in a while. So therefore, it is a question which has been uh, has been around, but in a completely different context. And uh, now it's uh, receiving a lot of attention. Now, this is one example where I think the, the, the more the more interesting idea there is, uh, the things become simpler you know, after many many confusing discussions, confusing confusing debates. Uh, the issues become simpler, and some once in a while you have a jewel coming out of it. And this is what we would like to do. Uh, we would like to find something simple right? in, the, in the in in nature. And uh, I would like to, uh, in this context, I would like to just to, let's say sketch some some of the things we have been talking about in this group and elsewhere uh, in, in in this in, in a particular let's say disorganized uh, somewhat. Uh, uh, fuzzy uh, context, and uh, my presentation will be just briefly what I think is going on, at least in my, in my way of thinking in the, in the, in the field, in, in what we would like to do in this group. Okay, well here is a, here is an objective. Now strongly interacting or called dielectric matter under extreme conditions maybe something like a uh, high density, because it's supposed to be cold, so it's uh, cannot be too high in temperature. Uh, these conditions can lead to, uh, this, this sort of study can lead to some something which can be done in the future by accelerators. And the, one of the things that is being, well, I, I pointed out here, is a pair accelerator which is being constructed 
the GSI upset. And uh, hopefully that will lead to new physics which is not uh, covered by something like the LHC. The kind of uh, reasoning or thinking that goes into this particular uh, branch of uh, science or physics is that uh, one would like to first of all start with something we already know like nucleons and then go to nuclei and nuclear matter and then the meson condensations in other words meson degrees of freedom coming into in particular here condensed matter which we refer to here then the strange clock matter and then convex stars and possibly to black holes this is all line of thinking that one associates with this kind of discussion now um, there is a, a, a recent development which seems to indicate that something interesting is happening and that is that the, uh, there is a, a, an observation of a 1.97 solar mass uh, object in a, <coughs> a radio pulsar which has this name and uh, that brings up something which is uh, rather surprising in the confused issue that I will talk I will just sketch later on. And uh, associated with this kind of ideas that, that are uh, presented, you have some motivation that perhaps QCD is not necessarily the right language to use at this point of the element. Perhaps it is something else, the holographic idea might, might be essentially lead us to something which we have not yet thought about. Okay, so that's the objective of this particular uh, essay, this lecture. We'll see that uh, this, is, this is going to be discussed by various people in the group. Okay. Now, well, that, that we have seen many, this is what is called phase, phase diagram, and I, I don't you know, the temperature and density, and you see all kinds of things. Now, I don't really understand this because I haven't done much work in any of this. So I'll just, uh, again, my, my code, which is much simpler. I have very little, uh, only universe this direction, and uh, convex stars that go this direction, and there are some experiments going on, there are some matches going on, and then uh, I, uh, uh, what I would like to focus on is, is along, along this line, and I forget about what has been going on here. Not that they are not interesting, but they are, they are, uh, there are a lot of other developments which people are taking care of. But it turns out that uh, as you go along this line, sometimes you have to be, you have to be at high temperature. So we'll see that that uh, that amounts to the discussion. Okay. Now, uh, that's a, that's an interesting curve which NASA has distributed. Uh, it's a picture distributed. For instance, the neutron star. It, 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 there's a it, there's apparently a strange fucking star is being uh, found, or at least discussed, and we'll even come to that here even in this particular group, uh, that's supposed to be much smaller than the usual neutron star that has been considered. Neutron star which has made, will be made of neutrons, whereas uh, the strange clock star is made of strange clocks. This. But it's smaller, smaller. And we'll see what that 1.97 solar mass uh, object is telling us about what this could possibly be. Okay, so that's the, that's the kind of things now, uh, right. now, in talking about this subject, in talking about those things, uh, WCU has, well, WCU has a certain uh, mission uh, in the sense that the, whatever is being discussed here will have something to do with the, this accelerator which is being, being built in Korea. And if this Korea is a, it's a radioactive iron beam accelerator. RI. But it's being built in Korea, so it has a core in front of Korea. But it's not E here, it's I. And that's a machine, it's a naval machine. And then uh, there will be an a, a institute associated with this grand ideas of uh, new technology and science development in this country, and that, that institute is PSI, and uh, apparently this is being now formalized in this country. So. So all, all these objects that uh, we would like to do have something to do with the Korean future. And indeed, you see, 
there's a present in peace right there. Yeah? And, uh, this country is surrounded by distinguished people. And it's those guys, the young people, who say, <laughs> they're going to take, we are <laughs> going to take over <laughs> the <laughs> developments in the technology and science. And they're going to be the one who will actually do something. Yeah? And those are the ones who are talking about it. Moment. And uh, uh, the ones who are sitting here, the younger people, are the ones who will connect between this group and this group. And those are all high schools. So, so there is this. All right, now, let's go. Uh, what is this business of a PSR? Uh, this pulsar, which has been detected. Now, I call this uh, a kind of revolution because it's it's not really a revolution in the sense of a, a series of screen, screen revolutions and uh, other revolutions that you have seen in the in physics uh, circles. But it is, it is it could be a, a revolution because that gives you some some uh, uh, hint of what nature actually is, might be. And it's a radio pulsar which has a which has small air bars. They detect the air bars tiny and it's a very small air bar and it's done by Shapiro today and so on experts will tell you why this is really illegal. And in fact, uh, uh, I think uh, Chang Wan Yi, who is in Kutang National University, uh, is going to talk about this in some meetings, why, why he believes that this is something which is real, whereas all the other stars which has been hanging around uh, have a lot of uh, question marks. And it turns out that this is the, this is the largest determined neutral star and it makes a lot of, uh, lot of waves in astrophysics and the nuclear physics. And this is very much unlike the former uh, massive star which was di discussed by Nice at Princeton University, which had a 2.1 solar mass uh, away uh, with a, something like 10% error bars. 10% error bars. But it turns out that that measurement which was uh, with this exactly also a lot of people at that time uh, turned out to be wrong. So now it's uh, 1.2 solar mass, so it's much lower than. So this is indeed the uh, benchmark of, uh, of the observations. Yeah. But if you look at the, uh, this, you know, the, the neutron stars, particularly in the binary sector, you see that they all lie along this line almost. Okay. There are some exceptions all along this line. And those are, this tend to be very binary. And that's roughly somewhere below 1.5. 1.5 would be right here. So they are 1.4, somewhere at 1.4. And some, uh, the, in fact, there's a tail of, close tail of, those are somewhere, I, I cannot identify, the very small error bar sitting there, uh, which is the most precise measure, one of the most precise measures neutron stars, all this mass range. So uh, it's all clustering around here, and suddenly you have one which is 1.9 here, and two, let's say. There's one here, but no, nobody has to think of that. This, this is the larger one. And, uh, and therefore, this is a kind of exceptional situation. Now, pre prior to this exceptionally well-defined uh, massive object, there is an argument by Hans, Hans Peter and Jerry Brown that Somehow, anything which goes beyond this, this bound should go into the neutral black holes. So there's this black hole scenario, which was uh, presented by uh, this gentleman. And uh, uh, it, it looks as if uh, that particular scenario that was developed by Hans-Peter and Jerry Brown is being taken over by this 1.97. So this is, in this sense, is very important. Okay? Now, if you look at the, uh, the curve, I mean, there are lots of, lots of people who calculated. This is essentially the result of a TOV, you know, solving TOV, the Polman Open Angle Polman Equation, which then tells you what will be the mass uh, versus the radius of the object. And uh, this is the, ex the recent experiment which gives you this bound here. This uh, has to be in this region. And uh, there, there's another one which is sitting here, but that's already superseded by this guy. Therefore, this is the mass, the maximum mass at the moment, which is being picked. And uh, any 
those are all equations of state, so-called equations of state. You have, you have a theory, whatever theory you have, you have a theory and you have an equation of state, and then you calculate it and see what, what that predicts. Now, all of us, you can see many of them. Right? People are very busy in this field. You can see, uh, uh, I don't think, uh, I'm not responsible for any of them, but there are lots of people that have done this, okay? Now, what they're saying is that this experiment is say any, any curve which is below this one ends below here. So, including this one almost. Uh, so, all this, all this, all this, all this. All this. They are there. Okay, so, so, all the equations, in Turkey actually, it turns out, the all equations of state with a can condensation, high prime, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, all this exotic thing, other than strongly attacking strange matter, are uh, simply without the diode itself. Uh, this means that there is an enormous number of papers for okay. So this, in this sense, is very important. And uh, what that also would mean that those guys sitting up there, those curves sitting up there, uh, they are, they, they are at the moment, uh, enjoying the, the possibility that they might be right. Uh, one of them is, is a famous one by Illinois people, uh, Americana, talking about Americana in the great gravel law. Uh, this, this curve is sitting, and a lot of people think that this is the right curve. Yeah, and then, then the days of restriction coming from the, the uh, radius. You see, if you have radius, see, this for any radius, it just radius all the way here, you know, so 10 to 15, something like that, kilometer. And if you were, then look at the, if you were to look at the radius, and uh, apparently, this is one of the, uh, uh, constraints that these, these people found is suggested, although they were, that the radius which is consistent with the experiment, those are all given here, these various experiment objects. The largest one is obviously the one which was found discovered. Those, those, uh, those, those are the ranges of the uh, predictions made by those, the, those theories. Uh, and uh, you, you see that the uh, here would be the largest mass which is seen. So the, the objects, it's red and those various different colors would indicate what kind of uh, what kind of star information there would be. And they all lie somewhere around 10 kilometers. So as you saw before, anything which is greater than 10, let's say one, they are eliminated. They, they give you a limit. There are, there are only a few left. It seems to be in the range. Okay, so that's the situation. And then, then you look also the pressure versus the variant density. The analysis shows that the, uh, the experiments are essentially telling you it should be somewhere around here. And therefore, here's a curve which is, which is given by GSI. Uh, this GSI is the one with the can conversation, and that curve goes through one point, but it disagrees with this one, and there's another one, which is AP4, AP4, which is the one which is favored by the nuclear physicist, while it goes through here, but it disagrees up here. And the uh, Chihiro, on, on Thursday, we did a talk on something which has something to do with uh, around, around this region. Uh, it doesn't look as if it, his talk, her talk has anything to do with it, but you, you see, that's, that's the kind of connection. Which would be, which will turn out to be very interesting. So it, she would give a talk on Thursday. And those people who are not on Thursday, you should ask her before the very interesting. Okay. Now, this is the, another activity which is, which is going on here, and that's uh, the K stands for here. It's a Kelvin. Kelvin is part of this project, and HK is a Kelvin. Uh, so now what, what they are saying, it's the same curve as before. That is to say, mass versus radius seen through the TOV equation. And he sees that, okay, here if you were to have a nuclear metal alone, it will go like this. So we are also any, any one of them will be the uh, possible ranges of the uh, parameter of uh, the values. However, if you have a clear condensation set in, then the dead object starts going down. That's part of this line. And uh, if there was nothing there, no further 
the use of freedom, then this will collapse to the fall. That's it. However, as we know that there are fox. So if there are fox, then depending upon the interactions which are involved in the problem of fox, uh, it will follow this line and disappear into the black hole. Or follow this line, or follow this line. Now if we were to follow this line, those we'll guys will accommodate, accommodate the, uh, the 1.97 object at a distance radius by 10 kilometers. So it's, it's okay. But the point that I would like to emphasize here is that you go into this regime where the quarks come in. And those regimes where the quarks come in are very dense objects, something of the order of 10 times nuclear matter density. It's not something which nuclear physicists could just sit down and calculate, but it would involve something else. And that's the, that's the whole point. So, so what is the parameter that distinguish A and C? Ah, uh, that's the interactions. That's the perturbative corrections in the, uh, in the equation of state in terms of parts as a result. In other words, uh, if you take a non-interacting quark, just back constant, then uh, you will follow this line. Now, if you introduce another back constant plus uh, different back constant, back constant because if you have to balance the pressure, plus some interactions, they say weak interactions among the quarks, follows this line. And then, if you introduce another interaction, it follows this line. None of which is given by QCD. You cannot, you cannot say it. But it is, it is dependent on the interaction. So you need a more equivalent? Huh? More equivalent? Uh, yes, yes, we see. In, in some sense, yes, it's more repulsion. Because it, it requires a repulsion. Otherwise, it will collapse. Okay, now this is involved. But look, if you look, the nuclear matter density is given by this, this unit. Theory cube using theory cube. Nuclear matter with the K condensation, you, you, you saw that you saw before that the, you can have a situation where you can have here the nuclear matter and K condensation can coexist in this region, and it's low mass. Uh, it is cannot have any, any mass greater than let's say about 1.6. So it's inconsistent with the, uh, the observation. Uh, so anyhow, it, it, it is possible. It, that's, that's not possible in the sense that the uh, 0.97 is observed and the can is like that. But if you were to have that one, then the uh, density, even in that region, comes to somewhere around 5 to 8 times the matter density. And if you were to have uh, the region, this, this, this kind of curve, then uh, you need a density of something like 10 to 13 times the nuclear matter density. So you need a large density in order to, and uh, some kind of repulsion in the quark, uh, strange quark sector. But now, there's no, no good theory. And QCD cannot do anything, because QCD is only applicable for density much larger than 10 times the nuclear matter density. Uh, and uh, there's no theory. It's, in some sense, it's a model which has certain features, but it, it cannot be constrained. So here we need to say, oh, we need some help from here. So something else, and the uh, and hope is that holographic uh, approach could be good. So if you, well, we will hear from uh, Thompson Park. Uh, in, in, in their discussion, uh, it turned out to be high temperature. They need a high temperature. But they can, they are talking, over sometimes something like ten times nuclear matter density as a as a photon involved in there. So it's already in the, in this in this holographic uh, approach. They are talking they are talking in this regime and that's uh, that's certainly relevant although that there's a question of temperature. And, and we we also hear about the uh, phase which probably be also in that in that, in that area. So those are that kind of issues that are involved. Now, what is important, I already uh, Sanji just simply mentioned, is the repulsion. You need some kind of repulsion. At some short distance, you need a repulsion. Okay, okay so, so you ask, what, what, what is a repulsion 
have high intensities. But you cannot just squeeze two nucleons together on top of each other. The exclusion principle comes in and so on and so on. No, you cannot do that. So obviously, there must be a repulsion. But the exclusion principle is not enough. You need an additional repulsion, which is much stronger in order to get something like what is being discussed here. And uh, uh, so you ask, uh, what is the situation with the short distance repulsion if you say between two nucleon, there's a lattice calculation that's coming out. It turns out, that unfortunately, it turns out for the larger pi of mass than what the pi of mass is, it's a, the smallest pi of mass which is being looked at in terms of a lattice is somewhere around 400 MeV. Nature is 140 MeV, so it's a, it's a lot larger. Nonetheless, you see that the, if you look at the, this is a single isosignal and isotriplet. Uh, if you look at between two nucleon, Central interaction, you see that there is a repulsion at short distance. This is the distance, 20 gram distance, yeah, in, in, in terms of Fermi, yes. And uh, you, you see that there is a large repulsion at short distance. Now, depending upon the mass, there is a large variation on this part, but the, at, at short distance, it doesn't depend much upon that. Right? Well, that's obvious because pi and mass is, yeah, at that scale, the pi and mass scale is, is negligible, therefore, it doesn't depend on pi and mass. And it doesn't depend upon which uh, spin isospin channel you're looking at. So it's high to see That's true. And this one, how we call the large number. So could you say a bit why you consider such a high high frequency? I know, you, you, can, you cannot go down any further. <laughs> it's not the, you know, the lattice people cannot go down any further than Oh, uh, just technical. Yeah, technical. Yeah, going down to 140 would be an enormous amount of computer time. It's a technical matter. But the, I think what's, what's important is to note that it really doesn't depend much on it. And that's very nice. Now, in terms of the Yukawa picture, you know, old Yukawa picture, where the meson exchange is involved, and that's just very similar to omega exchange between two nucleons. And this is also, this, this repulsion is also seen in the holographic model particularly Sakai Sugimoto model. One can see this sort of structure. So it's a kind of universal thing. No matter what, you, what language you use, you, you seem to be, as long as it's a strongly correlated object, uh, strong interactions, you seem to see this. Okay? Now, as I said before, Chihiro will talk about what happens at uh, high density in, in a particular picture that she's going to use. And in this, she does find she does, she does find something strange happening if you stick to one particular. You do have a, you do have a, a short range of repulsion. However, if you follow one line of thinking, that is, a, that is a possible way to do it in a, in a QCD like approach. One finds that the at short distance, the, at very short distance, somehow something sets in in such a way that the suppression, the, the, the repulsion, which which grows in a free space, which just simply grow, gets suppressed in dense matter. It gets suppressed by the practice. 1 minus gv squared on gv going 1 as the current transition point is approached. Now, this must take place in the interior of neutron stars, provided the neutron stars are in, in made of nucleons at very short distance. Once it goes into quarks, other phases, we don't know what that is. We don't know whether this is going to be operative or not, but it is an interesting possibility. The only assumption which goes into this one, as far as I can see, is that there is a hidden of symmetry somehow in the in the in the in the flavor sector of uh, strong interactions. And uh, this hidden of symmetry is, is consistent with Weinberg's Mendel symmetry argument, which was given many years ago. But I'm not going to go into this. This requires much more discussion. But anyhow, it's consistent with uh, various symmetry arguments. And if you follow that, you get some uh, prediction, which is, again, quite different. Now, now it's the question then arises, how can polarity theory help? I said many times that maybe polarity theory can help in the situation that, that we are in. Great deal of suddenly and not interesting thing happening. Now, this is my personal point of view. Uh, not everybody would agree. My personal point of view is that 
there are basic attitudes to take in, in the uh, in string theory versus the hadron yeah, physics, not in this matter physics also, but uh, uh, it's not necessary to be able to say. But uh, in, in hadron physics, there are two basic attitudes. One is the point of view of string theories. Uh, the question then is, does uh, string theory, let's say, when it applies to uh, uh, some real interacting system, does it postdict the string interaction phenomena? In other words, does it uh, reproduce what's known in the in, in, in strong interaction physics? Now this is not a prediction. They are not in, they are not particularly arguing whether or not they would predict new phenomena which are not given by the QCD uh, theory, but something which confirms that the string theory works. Now, if this works, then uh, that's it. No, then they will go somewhere else and do something else. Uh, this is very much like the, uh, you know, I don't know whether you know, this is called the Pare approximant. You know, people have been working on Pare approximant many, many years ago, uh, since many years, and it's mathematical technique, which sums the high order terms and so on. And uh, I had a colleague in my uh, group at Sartre who, who was a world's expert, was world's expert on Pare approximant. So he went around, uh, he would go to a topic physicist, do you have a problem? Do you have a problem, a system where I can apply my variables? And then, then he went to nuclear physicist, do you have a problem that you, I can use my variables? And in fact, they were, like pion, pion nuclear interactions and so on. And then he went to particle physicist, do you have a problem where I can use? Now for him, it didn't matter at all whether uh, new physics is understood, or some physics is understood, he was only interested in knowing whether his approximation, I mean his approach works for. Now, for the string theory point of view, that's exactly what it is. They don't, they, so what? I mean, they know that string theory is extremely powerful, and if it works for Hadron physics, oh, that's fine. Okay. That, that's it. However, for Hadron physicists, this is a somewhat different question. Hadron physicists are frustrated in not being able to calculate certain things because it's so uh, strongly coordinated and strong coupling regime cannot be handled. So if you say, okay, well, string theory, some string theory can handle this strong coupling regime. Now say, say, can string theory predict something QCD is unable to access? If yes, then that's fantastic, and, and we should work. We should work to get to work on music. Okay. So this is my, this is our attitude. This is our attitude at the moment. Of course, I, I think it's, they are fully justified. The string theorists are fully justified taking this, this attitude, and that's fine. Okay. They are going somewhere else, but uh, that's fine. Uh, but this is our attitude in this particular, let's say, uh, circle of uh, uh, investigation. And uh, this, so uh, let me just take a hydraulic theory approach. But it's, it, then, then we were told by uh, string theorists, oh, watch out, the Q, HQCD is not HQCD. You know? For instance, N equal, N equal 4 supersymmetry on mu is not, is, is not QCD. But he explains this famous problem, eight hours, or one of four pi in the strong, strong couple of the QCP set. Now, we are also told that the uh, the Sakai Sumi model, which I will come right away, this is a sort of amazing thing. The Sakai Sumi model uh, works for some things in, uh, let's say, strong interaction, and I'm going to tell you something about it here, this is uh, sort of amazing. But they know that the, uh, the, the ultraviolet completion of that theory is not QCD. I, I just wrote down, I don't know what that is, but the extreme theories can say. <laughs> it's supposed to be six-dimensional a n minus one two zero theory. Completion is this. It has nothing to do with it. QCD. So it is not a QCD. So the question then is, why do they seem to work? If it works, and here it also seems to work, why do they work? Well, the most, uh, the, the only explanation we hear is, uh, oh, universality. But the universality applies to everything. So uh, uh, that's what it is. And of course, the, that's, that's not terribly satisfying. Okay. So now, let me give an example of how 
string theory, some, somehow string theory seems to work so well in this case. Take the same auto model, some extreme auto model, and I think you will hear about that from uh, I'm sure you, you also be talking about some extreme auto model. And uh, take just its generic structure, which is the, that is the, you know, what the generic structure for this, this model gives you this five dimensional and structure. Which also leads in the four dimensional uh, field, four dimensional, four dimensional, to an infinite tower, but not only just infinite tower, but you can also make it infinite tower of a stack, so hidden over symmetry. In other words, each tower, each, each stack satisfies some kind of hidden over symmetry uh, relation. This is certainly what well, this was already pointed out by but Anyhow, it's, it's that particular feature which seems to be uh, universal. Kind of universality. Now, in looking at this one, and uh, now we we cannot possibly talk about uh, you know all the two very large uh, momentum scale because uh, we know that it's not a QCV. So why don't we stick to very low momentum scale? So low energy, low momentum process. So if you if that were the case, then why don't we just simply integrate out in the sense of uh, you know uh, part final part integral or whatever. Uh, integrate out all sets of vector fields other than the lowest one, lower and omega. But making sure that a hidden local symmetry is preserved. Now it turns out that uh, this is equivalent to doing kind of correlation theory to order P4 in the, in the boundary gauge set. So it's like a QCD in an effective field theory but doing to order P4. And uh, that limits the process to a very low momentum regime. Never mind. If you do that, then uh, Massa has shown that you can write the form factors for nucleon then you get the photon in, the, in, in this form. There's, there's one term which has the vector mass on top here. This is kind of satisfying the what is called the uh, perturbative unitarity in the, in, the, in the vector mass on if you were to expand this one to, in terms of the mv squared, q squared, to high order, uh, you have to say, and if you satisfy the unitarity in the perturbative sense, then you, you know, essentially sum them into this form, and that's just the one particular way of summing the infinite series, or infinite uh, uh, series in the one over q squared, one over, yeah, one over, you know, q squared or mv squared expansion. No, you, you, if you assume Q squared is much less than MV, then you can make an infinite series. But we, you do uh, this particular so you just keep the, the top layer itself, and then make an expansion in the others. That means that the lowest one is Q squared or MV squared. So the constant term plus this, this uh, vector mass and term, and then Q squared, the next order term. And then there are Q fourth and so on, you drop. So you don't want to go high order. You cannot do that. Now, if you do this, and you preserve the fact that you are dealing with the hidden local symmetry, then you get the formula like this. This is this is a very generic formula. Right? You just take two assumptions: the perturbative expansion, hyperperturbation expansion, and the, the hidden local symmetry. You get this. Well, given this, then you take those parameters as as a kind of parameter. There are two parameters here. You know, two parameters here. And then you, you say, okay, what, what are the, what, what's the nature? Does it agree with nature? And indeed, it does agree with nature, uh, you will find. And the parameters which are essentially coming out of this particular fit is this number. Right? A has this number, this number, and then the chi square is 1.5. Okay. It's extremely good, and the fit looks like a See that the, this red curve is this one. Yeah? This, this is the field. In other words, those are the fields coming out of that particular infinite tower structure integrating out the higher tower. It actually leads to this structure of the sunrise universe. Now, compare this to phenomenological model with many, many parameters. You put many, many parameters with there are many points. So you put many, many parameters in terms of the various combinations of the the momenta and things like this. These people have been doing this uh, for uh, three decades. And if you compare this to that particular fit 
which actually this is fit to large momentum transfer. So you find that find this black line. And uh, this is Sakai Sugimoto, there's an infinite tower reduced to a, to the lowest one like this. And if, in fact if you look at the the by the way this is dipole, we really divide by dipole turns out the dipole is working very well. So the nuclear nuclear fact that's how it is, so it's, it's just some division of something. This is the prediction. That's a predictive values and this is the number of the Now the ratio of the predict, predicted object is now being measured at the JLA very accurately. Well I still have large error bars, but at low momentum transfer. It looks like this. And the uh, HQCD with two parameters goes like this. Whereas the the phenomenological model with many parameters goes like this. So it's a uh, it's far faster. However, however, if you apply the same formula to neutron, it just goes hey, well, it doesn't work at all. And therefore also we know, I mean people know, at least some people know that it must fail because Sakai three water model is large in expansion and the neutron four factor has large contribution for the rain correction. So it's consistent. So if you look at the particular thing that has something to do with the large end expansion, it works very well. And if it has something to do with the large end expansion in being important, it doesn't work. So, it's, so everything is consistent. Yes. Now there's another thing which is not very good with the holographic theory, is that there's a problem with the strap, the uh, scale up. And uh, I would say, People are desperately looking for traction. And one of the, you know, they did that problem last year. For instance, in the, if you take a nuclear physics approach and you do a, what is called a Valesca wind field, there are two contributions one coming from the this scalar and the other one coming from the omega meson. And it's in the mean field, you have something like this. This expectation value is roughly the same with the opposite sign. Some gives you something like this, it's minus MV, and that's what experimentalists see. But although the individual they are very large, there's a large cancellation, and this is the reason why you only have in nature of 16 MV, this is the hardest thing uh, to make prediction in terms of uh, QCD. QCD has a great deal of difficulty in making the same because QCD has a has a essentially a length parameter or scale parameter which is like roughly about Higher decay constant, and that's over. It's, a, it's roughly 100 MeV. It's not tens of MeV. So there's a there's a great deal of problem. But it is in mean field theory. This is what happens. However, here also the omega mass has to be much larger than the, the scalar mass. The scalar mass is about 10 MeV. So that's what this particular picture is explaining what nuclei are all about. And there are some experiments. I'm going to talk about this uh, in terms of the uh, models. I won't go into it. And you have to do that. Yeah. But the point that we have would be that in Sakai Sugimoto model, no medium range attraction that leads to the binding. So how does one look like that? That's a big question. Now, I come to an end some extraordinary claims. And uh, in this uh, game that we are playing, uh, a lot of things are known. I mean, I, as I said throughout this discussion, there are many things which are which seem to be working out fine, but you cannot just you know put your hands on it and say, oh, this is precisely what it is. No, you can't do that. So uh, uh, you have to make some claims. You, 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 you stick your neck out. That's that's the statement. And uh, uh, young people cannot stick their, their neck out because. Uh, they, they need a tenure, if they make a mistake, <laughs> and then their neck will be chopped off. That's not very good. But, uh, well, tenured people could. Okay, so here's, a, here's an attempt by tenured people. Okay, there, there are two cases. I'm going to give you two examples. One is, one is a QCD like theory. And that's an example which has something to do with what, what half scrolling and matter. I won't go deep into detail, but uh, you'll see what I, I'm trying to say. And the other one is the uh, H, HQCD. And there's a, there's a model which is being 
studied here, and that has a, a logical consistency. As far as I'm concerned, I see that there is a logical consistency, but uh, it, 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 there's an, it's an extraordinary claim. Okay? So that's why I would discuss. In fact, this is something which I actually don't something to discuss. Okay? That's your stuff. Okay. He's going to discuss that. So, uh, it, it requires uh, it, it requires great great depth uh, in, in some sense. Okay. So now the QC like theory makes a prediction. In, in fact, uh, this is in terms of the agency argument again, and uh, the agency has argued that oh, it's going on is the one which it realizes naturally for baryon and and for uh, the was invented by Scum many many years ago. QC tells you that that's something which should occur at large and C. And if it occurs at large and C, and if you push the large and C to a high density, then the, you should expect that the, the skirmion on a, if it's surrounded by many skirmions like this, on a, on a crystal, for instance, it's surrounded like that, and then you squeeze it, then eventually at some point, this, this one skirmion will fractionize into two, half, half, half skirmion. See, so it's a, that's a scene looks like jammed up, uh, half skirmion object. And this, this particular transition is a very robust. Uh, it, it may be nonsense to put the, the optical of the lattice. It may be nonsense to say NC large makes sense for UPI and so on. But once you accept that, this fractionization is very robust. It must happen. And uh, it's what's it's essentially everybody agrees that this. And in fact, the uh, Sakai Sui Motor model also predicts a similar thing in terms of insect terms. You take a insect term, and then you find that the half insect term arises, and it's called the time. So, therefore, topological argument, which is based on the QCV, on large NC QCV, makes this statement. And once you make this statement, then there are predictions that you make. The predictions are, first of all, you have a, this is a moment, it is a density, and that's that's the some order parameter which is involved. Uh, you, you can have a spermial matter at smaller density, and then at some point you have a half half spermial matter in which the order parameter corresponding to higher symmetry restoration somehow changes from that region to that region. So it's, it's in some sense it's higher symmetry restored, higher symmetry broken. However, there are pions around and, and variants around. So it is somehow confined, and then there will be deconfinement, and then parts and parts of the and so on. So this is a picture, and the consequence of this particular phase structure tells you that somehow nuclear mass doesn't change as you increase the density. So that's one prediction. I have one The interaction between one over the scale and the Yeah, in here. I don't know. I don't know. Really. I cannot say whether whether one cannot, one cannot talk about what the interaction is between the one half scorpion. They are bound. They are still bound. So they must be binding. It's not totally repulsive. So one half scorpions are bound to each other. So uh, there must be some binding in there. However, the interaction we cannot compute the interaction energy. So I, I'm not sure that I can tell you. I'm sorry. So where is the uh, non-running Ah, that will comes from the from the large NC argument. You know, nuclear mass should go like uh, like this, F pi star into K and uh, kappa, and uh, at low density, the 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 Lagrangian should look like this. So basically, uh, pi has the current algebra term, and then there's this uh, high order term. But this is for the boring yeah. regime, or this is only for special density regime? Ah, this is this is in the this is a this holds everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. for large n. Yeah, for large n. Yeah. Right. So we are so still is not supposed to work there. For nuclear, no, no, no. We are still does not work. It's a, it just doesn't doesn't drop as as it as it does in the in the gas on set. I'll come back. So in the nuclear sector, this, this particular picture tells you that nuclear sector in, in, the, in, in this picture, the nucleons do not scale all the way to the components. However, we know that it, well, that's real scaling right here. Uh, what, 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 is the, 
I'm sorry. What's the and the picture is the same? Uh, this is the extension on top of mm -hmm. this. The previous transparency. So this is the transparency is for what? Oh, this this is a this is a scopium on the lattice, which is describing the bearing. Uh, it, it describes the nuclear metal. Uh, the not, ground the, state. not the barrier. Not the barrier. So the barrier is an excitation on top of it, and that I, I'm, I'm describing in terms of this picture. But I'm just, uh, I'm just arguing on the basis of the uh, scaling argument. And also, I want to uh, uh, ask about the. Do you consider this discrepancy between F to pi star behavior and psi bar to psi star behavior as a consistency or inconsistency with the R scaling? Inconsistency. Inconsistency. Okay. However, then uh, the meson sector it just follows because it's, it's essentially governed by the hidden local symmetry. So whether it's uh, it's a skirmion or not, uh, it has a similar structure. So it's that it is still preserved. So therefore, you get you get a different picture. However, because we don't know whether this is uh, yet, we don't know whether this this picture, this particular property is right. In nature. So, therefore, the, this particular discrepancy from the usual DR scaling is a, is a kind of extraordinary claim because I, I, I am responsible for the DR scaling. So, it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing. So, okay. Now, I'm coming to your portal. Uh, the, well, here, here, here are the authors. At the moment, it is not published, but it's. Okay. Uh, including myself. Uh, the, my role there is just to keep telling uh, what happens in, uh, in what I call the boundary theory. I don't know what happens in the book theory, but I know what could happen in the boundary theory, and that's my role to tell you, to, to keep telling it. However, what they have done is, and I, I won't go into detail because uh, Sanjay will describe a part of it, my literature. but the point is that the but they see the consistency. Well, they see they see that first of all, the quark condensate goes up. Now, usually people think that quark condensate should go down, but there is a, a in terms of density, and there's, there's at, the, at the moment there is no experiment which tells you that it should go down. Uh, everybody th thinks that it should go down, but uh, there is no experiment or no no real argument that it should go down. Uh, maybe uh, some. Well, I don't know. I, I, I haven't seen any theory of this. And, and furthermore, they see that the, the pi and decay constant, the time component of the pi and decay constant, goes up. And this going up, this going up together, is, is quite nicely consistent with the uh, low energy theorem. Uh, so it's Q, uh, Q scale going up. And here, n pi star doesn't move much, or if anything, in the uh, it goes up, but never mind. Even if it goes up, it doesn't matter. Uh, doesn't matter so much because this one keeps going down and if it goes down this one has to, has to go down in order to match it but it doesn't so it's consistent they go together but both are challenged to QCD like arguments because if you were to talk with uh, anybody who's working with uh, let's say Gamujun or Asinio or whatever model that you have higher correlation theory they will agree that this is the right trend they will not agree. Sorry. They will not agree. Okay, next. But that's not the entire story. And uh, their picture is such that the, the definite mass is predicted to drop. Whereas this is supposed to go up. So it's not connected with the power content. It means it's predicted to drop as, as, uh, as you, I have indicated here. This is the kind of law. Alright, so the other challenge is then precisely is that somehow the mechanism mass has has nothing to do with the Q option. Now that's a that's a that would be a bad, bad news for Jerry because Jerry has been arguing I don't know for twenty years that the Q mechanism mass is the order parameter of higher transition. Yeah, so he, he he liked very much this this integration. Uh, he, at the moment he cannot say anything. I think I don't think you like it in whatever case. Okay, this 
So this QCD makes also an extraordinary claim. The claim, I mean, is that, uh, to the extent that there is no convincing, there's a proof that that, that, that should not be the case, uh, they have a chance. Okay. So the question is, who is right? And uh, I think the answer, as an answer, the answer is given in the next uh, picture. <laughs> I think this is Einstein. I have a brain that this person is Einstein. Anyhow, it's a nerd. A Princeton, uh, some Princeton, uh, bright Princeton uh, undergraduate or graduate, who is saying, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And then he keeps going all the way to, you know, he just fits up to a blackboard. He has nothing else to say. <laughs> so there's nothing else to say. Okay, but that's, that's what I would say. We need to, uh, this is essentially what the, my, my shooting is also. We cover all these things. And uh, I hope that the, the rest of you will tell us which way to go. Yeah, so that's, that's the end of my uh, introduction. Introduction.